to this computer. All right, my name is Johnny. Uh, with me as always is my co-host Pat, and we are Subversive History. And today we have on uh, Mr. Alfred, uh, who just recently released a new book. And uh, I'm sorry, what was the title of it again? It's all about the land. It's all about the land. We have uh, Rick from the Decolonized Buffalo and Victor Jacket, or better known as Red Falcon, on almost every platform you could think of. Um, would each of you like to go around and introduce yourselves for our audience? Sure. Um, my name is uh, Tayaege Alfred, and I'm from the Mohawk Nation. And uh, I grew up in a community, and I'm from a community called Gothenwage, which is right outside of Montreal. And uh, I'm a philosopher and a former professor, and now I work with uh, First Nations government as a consultant, and uh, I do a lot of work in the U.S. as well on environmental and cultural restoration. I've uh, published four books. Uh, the one you mentioned is my fourth one. I have another one called Heeding the Voice of Our Ancestors, which is a political science book, really, about nationalism and Native communities, and then uh, Peace for Our Righteousness uh, in 1999, which is about leadership. And then uh, one called Wasaze, which is uh, decolonial theory and social movement and organizing in First Nations communities. Those are the three previous ones. And then I, I have It's All About the Land Now. It just came out last week. And it's a collection of speeches and essays. Um, not essays, I'm sorry. Speeches and interviews that have been uh, curated around the theme of uh, reconciliation and uh, this idea called uh, indigenous resurgence that I've been working on for quite a while. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, I'm coming to you from uh, the West Coast uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, the land of the Lekwungen peoples. And uh, I kind of go back and forth between here and my home territory of Gatunwage for my personal life and my work life. Wonderful. Thank you for giving us your time. Uh, Rick, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Rick. I'm Comanche. Most people know me from uh, the Decolonized Buffalo podcast, which is down for right now. And I will explain when I come back and it gets put back up. Um, and I, I am, uh, I have a master's in indigenous law here in the U.S. And I talk about mostly about decolonization, decolonial theory, uh, uh, decolonial Marxism. You can, you can say it like that, decolonial Marxism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, as always, Rick. Victor, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, my name's Victor Jacket, um, Seneca Nation, and machinist by trade. So I'm not uh, not really an intellectual by, by any normal measure. Um, I've been a guest on your program, on Decolonized Buffalo, and uh, on a few other programs as well, and generally just focus my social media presence on advocating and getting the message out there of the necessity of anti-colonial politics within the field of uh, Marxism and, and sort of liberatory thought. And as always, we always appreciate you coming on and always giving us your time uh, and educating us, uh, you know, all three of you, honestly, uh, you've been a tremendous resource towards uh, me and Pat learning, uh, especially because there is such just a lack of emphasis uh, regarding uh, decolonization, you know, within a lot of uh, leftist spaces you know, within the West. And, uh, you know, I think that all three of you have been uh, excellent guides for me and Pat continuing to learn and grow. Uh, you know, we uh, normally stream from, uh, I guess, what could, what would be Lenape territory. Um, and yeah, if there's anything you want to add, Pat, we'll uh, 
Yeah, for sure. Like on that topic of uh, decolonization, you know what I mean? As somebody who reads, you know, leftist literature, leftist history, I think we we pay lip service to this term decolonization quite a bit, but we pay lip service to it in faraway lands. Like I right. read books about Africa and I read books about Asia and I read books about South America, but very rarely do I read books about the land that I occupy or, you know, within the nation state that I am a part of. And I think that's a problem with like a lot of leftists. It's like, and, and I think it might have been Rick, who brought this to not directly to my attention, like he wasn't like calling me out, but more broadly, this space out where he's like, you probably know the entire history of the Soviet Union better than you know about the land that you live on and who it was colonized from. And I had to take a look in the mirror and be like, that's 1000% correct. So yeah. that's what kind of like led me. And I'm glad we were able to do this in a joint venture here with Subversive History is to begin to, um, you know, educate ourselves on that and having Rick on and having uh, Red Falcon on and now having uh, Mr. Alfred on is just the next step in hopefully educating ourselves more and more about the land that we live on in the nation state that we're currently taxpayers of, et cetera, um, as well as our audience, which may also have those same deficiencies in like sincere decolonial understanding. So, um, you know, now that we have uh, Mr. Alfred here, and obviously he did just um, write this new book, it's all about the land. Um, I guess like, you know, as I've read, you know, Peace, Power and Righteousness, which obviously, as he said, much about leadership and then Wasase in which he gets deeper into the decolonial theory, I guess we're just kind of with the premise that we've laid out, how would you say that this new book, it's all about the land, which unfortunately we have yet to read yet, kind of like goes into that education that, that could educate like Western leftist audiences in like the decolonial struggle in North America? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that this book here is different than the other ones because I produce those as theory, as an academic and in a scholarly mode. So, you know, I did my research. Uh, I was a professor at the time. Uh, I was concerned with engaging political theory at that level and uh, in, those, in those spaces. Whereas this book here, it's drawing on um, lectures that I gave, not only in university context, but in a, a range of like public engagements. So it was, it's really about engaging with people um, on the exact question that you're talking about, like is, where's my place in this colonial structure? Um, helping people understand what they might think, especially in Canada, uh, of their country as having a foundation that is solid in terms of justice and having so, uh, democratic principles, fairness, and, and all of these principles built into it, uh, helping them see through that and understand the injustice at the core of the relationship between the, the, the mainstream society and First Nations people. And then once I argue that, once I use different, um, I guess, strategies and tactics and and ways of bringing that forward in these different contexts, um, trying to get them to see uh, a way through that. And so it's it's engaging with citizens. So, and it's engaging with people. It's not writing, although although I think that even as a scholar, even you could tell me what you think because you've read it, but even as a scholar, I always try to do that to not lose people um, and to kind of stay grounded in my own experience as an Indigenous person and and not to go not to go into high theory mode but this one's even more so in terms of um it it really comes from conversations and dialogues um with people in different contexts and i think that's that's the difference with this book and the difference is it's it was it, it comes from a series of speeches and interviews that were done from 2005 onward and so for me, it represents like my effort to take the ideas in the book that you had in your hand there with Saze and bring that into a different context. So it's it's taken my theoretical understanding of colonization and uh, and the kind of decolonial vision that, that I had and the anti-colonial vision that I had developed over the years as a scholar and working in different movements. And then it's trying to bring that to people and trying to humanize it trying to organize it and present it in a way that can actually have an effect. So I'm not, I'm not just debating theory. I'm not just 
um, trying to persuade at that level of scholarship, but I'm actually trying to get people to move. So in, in all of these situations, it's also in the midst of putting into practice um, the lessons that I learned through doing with Saze about building organizations and, and building a movement and actually doing that um, and organizing people for a direct action, for political intervention, for decolonization um, in various ways inside of our own community. So these, these uh, speeches and the elements of this new book represent kind of like milestones along that that journey from 2005 until basically last year, you know, they, they go, they, they take that whole chronology and you can look at all these different segments of the book as like my posts along there. And, and so it kind of gives you a picture, not only of like what I've done and my ideas, but the movement itself. So the, the priorities kind of shift, um, the focus evolves and it changes as it would, right? after over 20 years. And so that's why I think this book is kind of like the, uh, to me anyway, and the reason I did it is to, to remind people in Canada who have been sucked into this notion of reconciliation, which is kind of a very moderated form of decolonization. And it's a very co-opted, uh, assimilative notion of justice, which is there's really no questioning the pillars of uh, liberal democracy and of capitalist society that you have to find your way in and, and you have to find a place for yourself and struggle to get justice in that context. Right. Whereas what I'm saying is no. And I think that's where it's more in line with people like yourselves and in terms of your thinking and your beliefs and your politics, which is no, it's, it's the foundations that, that need to be addressed and the, the pillars that need to be taken down in a new, in a new, arrangement of power and relationship between our nations and the settler society that's what needs to happen and yeah. uh and so that's what differentiates this from what in canada is the mainstream uh even among indigenous peoples this idea of reconciliation so it's kind of like accepts colonization as a fait accompli and then and then tries to carve out a place for us in it and to me that's unacceptable and uh it can be argued logically which i do in this book you know show the flaws and the logic and i mean from a principal position of someone who is is stating and believing and standing on the principle of justice that that it's it's flawed but it's also just not resonant with indigenous philosophy it's not resonant with the ancestral vision that our people had in 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 having conducted a struggle against colonization and so on an emotional level and on a on a philosophical level um you you have you have reasons <laughs> you have uh, you have a drive to reject this idea of reconciliation and i think it, a lot of people feel that in this country but not a lot of people are articulating that because most of our elites intellectual elites political elites um media artists have been co-opted into reconciliation and they're they're not advancing a true vision um, of indigenous nationhood. They're advancing a co-opted notion of uh, of an assimilative move to a place within the colonial structure. And so that's the basic it's the basic message of the book. And it's it's uh, I've been uh, identified with that as a thinker in Canada for decades now. And then I think people have overwhelm that message in academia and media just by sheer numbers and so this is a this is my contribution to that re-establishment of resurgence which is basically what i'm talking about resurgence as a factor and as a and, and to put the resurgence back on the political landscape and the intellectual landscape and not a resurgence concept that's been gutted of any political right. meaning that you, you re-inject politics back in. And, and none of our none of our political thinkers are doing that. And uh certainly none of our scholars are doing that. So it's uh there's a receptivity to that, I think, among uh, younger people and among 
um, people who are still committed to the idea of of nationhood for indigenous people. Um. I, so, so we want to, me and Johnny are going to want to take a step back and allow, you know, the other indigenous individuals that we brought on. Um, I do have just one more question and then I'm going to step aside and allow Rick and Victor, but just be, this is part of the notes that I actually took while I was reading the book. And you bring up this concept of reconcil uh, reconciliation and assimilation. And I thought that you are in a very unique position to comment on that because based on what I was reading um, in your books, you were, you went through Catholic school, you were an altar boy, you were in the Marine Corps, and then you were part of academia. You must have an extremely unique perspective as an indigenous person that probably would have, uh, would have been like a poster child for assimilation uh, based on all those things. Like that, you know, you would have done like the, the checklist of things for assimilation, but you were still here, um, you know, advocating for this more kind of like radical decolonial theory that is not re re recon reconciliatory or assimilationist. So can you kind of talk about your experience of, and, and I know that there's other individuals on the stream. I don't want to get too much into their personal lives because it's not written in books the same way that it is with yours. Um, can you just talk about, and if anybody else wants to jump in on that, then great. But uh, Mr. Alfred, could you talk about your perspective as someone that's been through those like levels of Western society as an indigenous person that is now kind of vying against this reconcil reconciliation movement? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, a lot of times over my career and my life, I felt kind of like uh, Colonel Kurtz. And- uh, <laughs> The power yeah, is now uh, part of darkness? Yeah, he's supposed to be, uh, he was supposed to, he was groomed to be a general. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, 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 was, he was the chosen one. Mm -hmm. And then something went wrong and he saw through it all, you know, and for him, it drove him mad. For me, it drove me back to my own, you know, my own route. Yeah. The, the horror. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like, like shaving his head. Because when I was younger, you know, like you said, you know, I, I, for whatever reasons, either chosen or self-selected or I did well in all of those institutions, you know, so I grew up in Gunawage. I guess the thing that saved me is that I, I was born and raised there and born and raised in a community that 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 was structured for resistance. I was born in 1964. I grew up in this era. We were we were impacted by the same social and political forces as in the United States at that time. So uh, I'm a kid growing up in the midst of red power, you know, the whole black power, red power thing. We had we had a resistance movement that started among uh, the Haudenosaunee, but was really, really prominent among the Mohawks. My family was involved um, all the way through. And so I had that growing up. And then for whatever, whatever reason, you know, my parents wanted me to go to school in the city. And so the tradition hundreds of years long is the Jesuits and the Mohawks, you know. And so we have that relationship. So I went to a Jesuit high school. That was my first and then altar boy thing, you know, and all that. Our, our, our community was in the midst of transitioning from like a very Catholic colonized community to, to one that we know now, which is this kind of resurgent, uh, very militant nationalist uh, Mohawk community. <clears throat> and so I was right in the midst of that. So, yeah, I was an altar boy or Catholic. But we made it uh, in my in my uh, later school grade uh, years, school years, and then into high school transition, you know, this is when all this happened. And so I started to pick up on all that. I started reading, start listening, all these things are happening. I'm 10, 12, 13 years old. And so the root of it, of my, of my life there, was in the church, was in a very colonized, controlled uh, existence. But, in, but right in my teens, it starts to change, eh? And so I'm, I'm, I'm like on one hand and then the other hand here, and I'm drawn to both of them. And uh, I, I I understood who I was. I was proud of who I was, but I also at the same time, like a, like a lot of young people, you know, you grow up in a certain environment and you want to, you, you want to leave, like you want to experience the world. So that's, that's a universal thing. And so it is a big tradition in our community. Uh, for those listeners in the United States, I think it's, uh, it's a known fact uh, that the Mohawk communities in Ganawagi in particular have the highest per capita ratio for military service of any community in North America. 
I didn't know that. So I, I, I had no I idea. Not aware of that. <laughs> so we have. There was a recruiting, a United States Marine recruiting <laughs> station in our community, you know, and they 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 were regularly there, and it's it's a fact that we have, and we're proud of it. You know, we're proud of the the warrior tradition and the military service and so forth. And so I was drawn into that. Um, I was drawn into that. So from from a Jesuit education to the military, not only the military but the Marine Corps and um in the infantry in the marine corps and uh and then from there when i finished up there going to uh university but then to ivy league university yeah just not university but cornell and um and so yeah what you were saying it's like i had every opportunity to to go into into the machine you know yeah <laughs> and uh, there are moments when i kind of thought that that's what i wanted but something always intervened for me to come back. And so I did very well in the Marine Corps. I was only in three years, but, you know, I was promoted and then I was offered a promotion and could have stayed in. I did the test for, for uh, languages. I wanted to go to OCS for officer school. Could have did all that. Um, I, when I did my, my degree, I could have gone on and stayed and just done political science and taught at some school or whatever, but something always happened that drew me back in. And, uh, when I was doing my back, my, my graduate training, that's when we had a ma uh, the major crisis in our community in a conflict in 1990, which became militarized. So we had developed over the years, our community collectively had developed the ability to resist in a physical way. So not only did they have a political agenda, they had been engaging in, um, uh, uh, semi-legal uh, to illegal form of trade of uh, taking tobacco over the border. So non-tax tobacco in the United States, getting it over the border and selling it in Canada where, where excise taxes didn't factor in and where sales taxes didn't factor in. And so people don't know uh, the cost of a carton of cigarettes in Canada is about 80% tax. So you can imagine the profit margins uh, where you can sell even a a discounted uh a discounted carton of cigarettes corner to market yeah. still still make uh, an incredible profit and so they started doing that in the mid 80s and you know it, it was the millions and millions flowing into the community and at first it was a communal economy it was it was a it was an economy run by the nation for the nation to develop the capacity to resist and uh, and it played out in 1990 when uh, when our community blockaded a uh, major highway bridge in, in support of uh, some of our other Mohawks that were protesting land uh, in in a community about an hour away. <clears throat> and that, that devolved into a militarized conflict over 78 days. So in uh, 1990, the, the, the government of Canada had more military force deployed against us than they did in, Af in, in the Middle East. So there was there was regiments, uh, fully armed regiments with uh, supported by, you know, the artillery and the, the armor, mm -hmm. air support, everything controlling these communities, Ganawage primarily, but also Ganasadagi, which is a smaller one, and to a certain extent in cooperation with New York State Police, Alguzasne as well, which is our other community. We so, uh, we played that documentary, Kanasataka. I'm probably mispronouncing the Yeah, the Oak of Rebellion it. documentary. We watched yeah, watch that on our stream. Yeah. Okay, cool. You so you've seen that and you see yeah. that focuses on Gunasadage and the, the particular conflict there, and it tells the story through the experience of those people. Just just so people know, it was like there was there was Gunasadage and Gun Ganawage is the bigger community outside of Montreal, where you see some scenes in that movie. Um where I would say most of the most of the direct conflict happened until right at the end. So I, you know, having lived through that, it's hard to it's hard to kind of come back or come through that and believe in the promise of justice inside of those right. institutions, you know. And so, so for me, I think that what I got out of engaging in all of those was uh, a set of skills, uh, knowledge. Um, a capacity to organize and think, and uh, importantly, experience within those systems to understand them. And uh, 
beyond beyond the ones you mentioned. I mean, afterwards, I started working in, in politics in our own community, in government, in our own community. I became a land claim negotiator and 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 then kind of worked at the the federal level too. In um, in the in a royal commission, it's called. It's kind of like a Senate hearings uh, in the United States. It's like a royal commission that went on for four years, and I was a staff member there researching indigenous youth issues and things and so I got to meet a lot of influential people and, and work in those circles and then became a negotiator for our community on land claims and took that all the way up to to uh, the end result of that which was uh, not a resolution but um, a stalemate so all of this kind of culminated in me having a clear understanding of, of what was possible um, and then where the where the limits are, you know, where, where you hit the wall in terms of trying to take your community forward. So my, my teaching and my writing has always been in that frame. And so I, I make clear to people, I say, if your aspirations as an indigenous person getting involved in all of this are cooperative and, and um, moderate in terms of just doing practical improvements on services or something like that for your community. Yeah, you can do that. You know, you can do that by getting involved in these things. There's there's opportunities for change incrementally and so forth. But I've always felt the responsibility to represent uh, the more cutting edge or the more the, the vanguard aspect of it in, in terms of, well, there's people doing that. You know, there's there's a lot of people who will recognize this fact and who are doing good work to make things better on a, on a, on a more like daily level for people. So for me, it's like, well, I'm going to, uh, I managed to get a professor's job. Um, uh, I have the opportunity to, to have my voice listened to. And so my responsibility is to push the envelope. And so pushing the envelope means continuing to advocate for the full package of justice. So uh, I listen to our ancestors, I listen to our elders. What's the main problem? Well, the main problem isn't just the fact that there's a marginalization of our people in the workforce, there's racism here, the water and sewer isn't as good as in uh, the town next door. Those are all real things that need to be fixed. Right. The real problem is our land was stolen and our governments were denied legitimacy. So you're saying it's all about the land, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see by the title of this recent book basically harkens back to the first lesson I learned. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's I think that's enough. Unless John, you had anything, or do you want to turn it over to uh, Rick and Victor to see if you know how they want to interact with this? Because I don't want to take up too much time here. Yeah, because I no, know they I'm... they've been sitting quietly on the uh, yeah. on the side there. Quick message to any white settlers, especially the white settlers, if you <laughs> have made it this far and you are still listening, <laughs> if you haven't you, turned this off, if you haven't turned this off and you're feeling some type of way, right? The immutable characteristic of being a settler right behooves you to learn this information right to get involved right to educate yourself to be able to assist in decolonial efforts right it shouldn't just be this like you know this this uh the, 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 this curse upon you that like you know you should disagree with decolonial efforts or you should dis disagree with like anybody that has to say anything about this right and you should never educate yourself on this because it makes you feel bad okay that's part of this all right that's part of like you know it's your responsibility as a settler to educate yourself to want to to fight colonial efforts to fight imperialism right if you can feel that same way about imperialism, if you can feel that same way about capitalism, right, and you can like learn all these things about why capitalism, you know, has destroyed our world or why imperialism destroys the world at large, right? You know, you you can you can do this one too, all right. It's it's all part of it, but uh, I'll let you guys take the rest of it. Well, actually, okay. I like what you said, like what you just said, Johnny, because. Uh... I mean, a lot of people that I've worked with over the years and that I continue to work with right now, they're they're people from from the mindset and, and the philosophical camp and the political uh, the political ideology that that you're from and that you're talking to. You know, the, the lawyers that help us work through legal processes to when we're battling Monsanto and Pfizer and big giant mining companies to protect our land. 
they're working with us who are coming at it from a perspective of indigenous nationhood, but also there's there's common ground because yeah. there's environmental ethic. And there's a there's there's the view from their part that capitalism is the problem and capitalists are the problem and they need to be reined in. And so it's not a it's not either or, you know, like it's like yes said, and harming everybody who's a settler that you're all wrong and you have nothing to say or do here. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, the the people who were the lawyers, one of the lawyers for our, our warrior society in 1990, this guy was, I think he also worked with the Chicago 7. You yes. know, and, and uh, the the people that I work with now, um, I, there's not that many people who are, say, un, uh, involved who would see it where it's black and white, where it's us versus them. It's it's a it's a principled struggle for a different ethic, a different way of life, and a critique of capitalism, and that draws in lots of different people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. It's that commitment. It's that principled commitment. And I think the only difference would be, say, the people that you were just speaking to, is they haven't yet been exposed to a truth that is one facet of of imperialism, the one facet of imperialism everywhere is the subjugation of the indigenous people and the denial of their knowledge and their environmental ethic. So thus capitalism and the climate crisis and all that is a colonial problem. Right. And people may not see it that way, but it's a problem of colonialism because the, the environmental ethic and the way of life that would have created a regime here that could sustain life has been denied. And, and one that is just oriented towards, as we all know, other objectives, is the one that's become dominant in the in the machine that we're all living within. And so it's absolutely essential, I think, to combine the anti-capitalist, the anti-imperialist, and the pro-indigenous perspectives in order to have an alternative to what we have now. Because there's no alternative from within. Right. My that's generally indigenous philosophers' critique. It's like the instinct is there. There's some great ideas. Of course, Marx, we we take Marxist analysis and so forth but it also needs an, a, an environmental ethic mm -hmm. and, and a concept of democracy that is not present in any of these other things and so we need to bring them together so anyway that's that's what i had to say about that and so if that did happen it would be it would be truly revolutionary Rick, uh, uh, Rick, uh, Vic, yep. you, you guys want to get in on this? Yeah. So, Mr. Alfred, uh, I really appreciate your time. Nice to see you again. Um, you know, the, the the thing about your book that I like is it takes interviews, right, uh, that you had or, you know, um, have done in the past and they put them in a book. When I was introduced to your work, it was many years ago, over a decade ago, right, um, I actually found your work via YouTube. Right, because you you have a lot of speeches on YouTube, right? And I think so. You know, when I when I navigate these spaces, you know, indigenous spaces or even like Marxist spaces, you know, Marxists have like a free um, source online where you go, you can go to Marxist.org and just read everything in Lenin, right? <clears throat> so, so when I when I encounter settler Marxists, they don't they don't really understand the economic theory, and I always you know refer them to your work. Right. And um, but with your work, a lot of it's on YouTube. I, it's always sending your, your videos to people like, all the time. There's a video on YouTube called The Meaning of Territory in Indigenous Cultures. Right. And I think it's really good interview you did. Right. I don't think it's in your book, um, but um, I, I think that, you know, with this new generation of new technology, with new, new, new generation of, of theorists, indigenous theorists, you know, philosophers like yourself, your your work has been captured by technology, which I appreciate, right? I, I imagine what it would have been like, you know, we had this technology with uh, past, you know, theorists just like Howard Adams, you know. I mean, I imagine he would have, you know, really awesome <laughs> videos too, you know, but I really do appreciate that book, how it captures, you know, the, 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 your, your work that you've done, the verbal works you've done, which I think is also important, you know, and I think within our own communities, um, like the verbal, you know, verbal, oral history is very important. I think what you've done 
is, is very important. I think my point of view is that uh, you are one of the most important decolonial theories we have so far, right? And I would, you know, so my point of view, my question would be, how were you able to, out of all the, you know, interviews, interviews you've done, of all the videos you, you know, have online, what, how do you choose which ones <laughs> to put in this book? <laughs> yeah, that's um, a bit interesting to have my uh, editor on here, and uh, uh, who who comes as an anarchist and uh, a settler person, you know, and so we, we had this uh, dialogue, and that's part of the answer, Rick, is, you know, we had our conversation, and I had many conversations, and she said the same thing when we met. She goes, geez, I've been, I've been watching YouTube videos for weeks now, you know, and all this stuff, and uh, how do we pick? And, and so we had to come up with a, some sort of a methodology, you know, for, uh, for choosing which ones we were going to present in the book. And so uh, I, I deferred to her at first because uh, my my reasoning was, well, I was the one that gave all these talks. So to me, you know, the message I wanted to put out, I put out and they're all there. But who knows how they connected? You know, like I, I can't really say other than being in the moment and seeing people's faces and trying to remember what the receptivity was and what the conversation was afterwards you know, which ones were the best, so to speak. And so I, I put it on her. I'm like, well, which ones, which ones connect most with you? Because really you know, what we're trying to do is, is connect with people and which ones moved you or which, which ones caused you discomfort, you know, all of those things, basically, which of these speeches uh, and interviews were the most affecting. And so she came back with a bunch of them uh, that she mentioned and I, and then I did that that self reflection, and I thought back to myself. When she gave me the list, like, is this one still true to me? You know, is this is this something I still stand by? Um, is this is this a message I still want to put out there? Um, um, so on all of those criteria, then we came up with this list of the ones that that were most affecting in her view, and then for me, which I recall also being received very very positively. In terms of people coming and saying how important they are, and then also, do I do I want this to be going forward? And uh, then 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 we work with that material. So for so the next question was how do we present it? So you know we had all this material, and given the fact at first, Rick, we did say like everybody can just go to YouTube and watch almost all of these, you know. And so what's the point of doing a book? <laughs> and and we we had the idea well maybe the book could be kind of like a supplement uh to to the technology where we could do it kind of like pastiche style or collage style or in a more anarchistic way so you know we had red and black cover real anarchist and uh and no page numbers and all kinds of stuff you know and, and important, that was important stuff <laughs> we, we we conceptualized it that way so that people would kind of like watch the video get turned on then use the book as kind of like like a little red book kind of thing like oh here's the quote here here's this you know and uh we had fun with that for a few months but then uh then we then we start thinking no actually you know for us in the circles we're in uh youtube the technology's there younger generation but in fact uh people my age like 50 something and older they, they don't use it as much you know they're they're influential people they're they're in positions of power. Um, they read, so there is a there is a readership out there, and so we said, okay, let's let's use this book uh, to reach them, and uh, and so we we decided to to conceptualize it in the way that I presented it there, like a chronology. So so here's a chronology, um, all the way back to 2005 after Wasaze. And so then, and then that helped us narrow it down even more. So, you know, you, you didn't want to have it front loaded to like 10 in 2005 and only three in 2010 or something. So it helped us kind of space it out as well. So that helped as well. And then, uh, and then, then we su supplemented it with interviews. And you know what, Rick, the, the editor, when we were going through the book, uh, he messaged me and he said, you know, this is after he first saw the manuscript. 
He said, I really love it. We're going to do it. Um, it's, it's, it's powerful, but really the interviews are the best part. And he said, I, I, I like, I really like the speeches, but I love the interviews. And, uh, and I really appreciated that too, because, you know, that, that shows that the, 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 the material had the, had the, um, like there was flexibility in it. Some people I'm sure would respond differently. They would like that. He he found the interviews very powerful as, as a person. He liked that kind of style engagement. So for me, I was like, okay, here now we're gonna have a product in a book form that can be taught in schools that someone can sit down with and, and work through this whole idea of reconciliation um, and resurgence and understand it and could, could be, could be a, a good supplement to the work that I'm going to continue to do by getting out there and speaking and so forth. And so it was all, it was all those, like all of those were criteria for, for selecting because um, yeah, you, you end up having to make a choice that like we, we thought it would have been really cool to do it, to do it the, uh, the first way. But in the end, uh, I think that we made the sensible choice in terms of having an impact uh, on people who are, who are going to be making decisions and who are thinking about these things in a way that uh, could could translate into change in the society, you know. So we know that we know the YouTube videos are there. People are going to continue to watch them, hopefully. Um, but this is just another supplement to a supplemental uh, instrument, I should say, to to uh, to those things. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I do want to ask questions so you maybe get your your insights. Um, because you know you bring up you bring up the word anarchist, and I know that there's there's going to be some settler Marxists that are, that are going to be like, oh, is he an anarchist? Oh, I, I don't care about you know reading his stuff now since he's an. I don't know if you are an anarchist or not, but you know this is the attitude that I feel like a lot of settlers actually have when I bring up telling them to read like you know Vine Deloria, your work, even Kim Talbert, Pam Palmer, you know, all these native voices. And they always ask me, are these natives Marxist? And I tell them they don't have to be because <laughs> they they are addressing the contradiction of cellular colonization, right? We don't have to be Marxist. You know, I'm a Marxist in my part, you know, my own myself, you know, and I advocate for de decolonial Marxism, but I don't think it's the right thing to do to dismiss indigenous voices that are addressing cellular colonization that are not Marxist, you know? So the other aspect is, you know, um, you know, it's it, it's really hard as a native person to navigate these spaces. Um, I don't know if you ever encountered this yourself, or or with it, even within the community, because I know there's a lot of, for some reason, there's a lot more indigenous anarchists than there are decolonial or indigenous Marxists, right? And a lot of them say, a lot of indigenous people say, you know, that Marxism is. A, col a colonial philosophy, which I, I disagree with to a point. I think the early stages of it was right, rooted in <clears throat> colonial, uh, uh, you know, um, ways, but I think it has morphed like, you know, with, with China and Vietnam and Africa, you know, and, and in Latin America. But I think, what are your thoughts about that when, you know, when you see non-native or settlers dismissing, and have you encountered that dismiss indigenous voices, you know, in the political realm? And, and native voices too that within you know your communities yeah i mean i haven't encountered it I've, I've i've heard you talk about it um and it doesn't surprise me uh i've been to anarchist book fairs and and things like that and so i know that there's a lot of people who are just uninformed or immature in their thinking and even in their their person <laughs> who get involved in all movements including anarchism and marxism so it doesn't surprise me that there's those kind of reactions. But I think for me, um, it's in line with something you said where they don't have to be. Um, because I could see, I mean, and obviously anyone who's read my writing and listened to me talk knows that I, I take Marxist analysis of capitalism. I think we're all Marxist, right? Like we understand what Marx was saying about capitalism and even if we don't accept everything he said, and we don't, we're not, we're not using all the the analysis that he offered in his writings. We we do see the world through Marxist eyes, and so 
And then there's thinkers who are anarchists and there's thinkers who are socialists and there's thinkers who are feminists. And there's all kinds of people who we learn from as indigenous people and we take uh, take some wisdom from and we take techniques or methodologies uh, or analyses from, but they're not us, you know? And so I have the, uh, I was born as a Mohawk in a Haudenosaunee context and that makes me a Haudenosaunee. That makes me indigenous. And so to kind of step out of that and take on another ident identity, even if it's an into comes from an intellectual tradition, a political identity as a Marxist or an anarchist or a socialist, to me, is unnecessary because I already have a home. Like I have a philosophical home. I have a community. I, there's a whole tradition there. There's a whole set of teachings. There's a whole philo philosophical framework. And so I, and, and it's expansive enough and it's open enough for us to say, yes, we can learn about the modern world and capitalism from people who have lived through it and thought about it and have something to say that's powerful about it. I can take that with no, with no problem and no inconsistency and say, that's true about capitalism. That's true about the way societies operate. That's true about governance from an anarchist. That's true about uh, patriarchy from a feminist. I can take that and, and, and use that to strengthen my philosophical framework. But being so rooted in an indigenous culture and, and community, I can't step out of that. I, I can't. I can't step out of that and say, well, now I'm a Marxist. And, and my, my Marxism is informed by my indigeneity. And I'm not criticizing you, Rick, or anybody else, because, you know, you have a different experience, no doubt, that that moves you in that direction. And I have a friend in Kahnawake, he's very strong, Haudenosaunee, warrior mentality and so forth. And he calls himself an indigenous socialist. So he he's come to understand himself in, in, a, in a particular way. But, you know, I think that's the that's the answer to your question is that most indigenous people are rooted in that philosophical framework that comes from their heritage and the deep roots of their culture and their ceremony and their language. And it's not, it's not a slight against anarchism or it's not a slight against Marxism or anything like that to not embrace it. It's, it's just to say that my identity is so strongly rooted that I'm taking tools as opposed to transforming myself into a new ideology or a new, a new identity. That for me, that's the way it is anyway. Because I've, I've, um, for for a few years, you know, we we had we explored the idea of anarcho indigenism, and and had ongoing dialogues and trying to build movements and so forth with people who who were identified as Marxist and and part of Marxist movements, and uh, learned a lot, uh, developed some friendships, um, experienced uh, some things, and then. That's when I came to this realization, I think, and it, it took a while to crystallize in my mind, you know, about about what I'm describing just now. But it was through that experience. It was a good it was a good experience because it kind of reinforced with me the idea that as a as a Ongoy Homeway person, as a native person, as a Mohawk, um I can relate to others, but uh, I shouldn't ever step out of my responsibilities within my own culture. And take on new responsibilities, which may be useful in certain contexts, but they're, it's not true to who I am. And I, I, I hope that people who are Marxists and anarchists don't see that as a, a, a negative, you know, or I don't see why they would dismiss indigenous state thinking or indigenous activism just because it doesn't it doesn't accord with their sense that everyone should be a Marxist. You know, that, that sounds very, uh, if I wanted to be provocative, that sounds very Catholic to me. You know, it's like, uh, unless, sounds, unless you're Catholic, you're in the wrong church. So it's well, quite di dogmatic, I would say, yeah, I think is the term yeah. they use. Chauvinist, chauvinistic, dog, chauvinistic. orthodoxy, all yeah. those things. Yeah. Cultish. Yeah, I, I agree with, I agree 100%. I think I, what I, you know, I deal with everybody here in this channel, Victor, Pat, and John have has dealt with dogmatic Marxists that, or, you know, I think they dismiss the colonial theory, those are the settler Marxists, you know, 
and it's really hard to, <laughs> to get through to them. I, 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 you know, this is a whole different conversation, but I, I 100% agree with you. Um, I don't know if Victor wants to have a question before. I know we, we, we hit the 45 minute mark going to an hour. Victor, you wanna have, do you have a question before to close it out? Um, well, I had one earlier, but I don't, I don't know if the time passed, but um, er, earlier, you know, you and Johnny both were commenting on you know, the role of, um, you know, non-Indigenous people in this. And it made me think of uh, one of the lines or paragraphs early in, in Wasase, where you talk about um, repairing or curing the perspective of, uh, of the settler. Um, and I, I just felt that that was a worthwhile point to make. And then secondly, um, I think me personally, I agree with your perspective, um, that you had just explained, um, only that I would explain it differently, um, because I feel that perhaps not necessarily the analysis of capitalism, but the, um, ideas of the structure that society should take um, are actually ideas specifically from from our people, Haudenosaunee. So um, for me, the reason why I consider myself a Marxist is because I feel like it's my responsibility to correct the mistakes that were filtered through uh, Eurocentric anthropologists that became the source for Marx to um, sort of siphon aspects of our society out of. Mm. And I, I'm just curious is like, do you have any thoughts on that? That's such an interesting uh, question and point, Victor. To me, I mean, I haven't spent a career um, focused on Marx, Marxism, but I know enough to understand at the point you're making in terms of there being a direct link between the work of Morgan as an anthropologist and then through Hegel and Marx about the ideal, the, the development of the ideal society being reflective of what they saw uh, operating in reality uh, amongst our people, particularly the Haudenosaunee. And then you bring in the anthropologist and, and that's a question for me is, did they really see the way our society operated or was it an anthropologist kind of interpreting <laughs> our society for the purposes of informing a European society? And so that, that's that's such an interesting question. But I, I think that no matter which way you look at that one, there was the, the there's always been among the Haudenosaunee kind of like being the subject of, of idealization, you know, where when they first encountered us, what did they call us? The Romans of the New World. Um, then then uh, Franklin and Jefferson and all them patterned the U.S. Constitution after the, the Great Law of Peace. Um, and it goes on and on. And then you got Morgan with, with Marxism. And so we've always been the subject of their gaze. The question for me is, did they get it right? Um, what did they see? What did they want to see? And how do we, in this feedback loop where, because of colonization, we, we the, the descendants of the original subjects of that gaze, um, lost a lot of what they observed in the first instance, and then had to relearn what was Haudenosaunee from those texts. It's a crazy thing to think about. So people reading Morgan people reading uh, all of the anthropologists and people thinking through what Franklin said about the Haudenosaunee as opposed to actually having lived through it. That's a, that's a crazy thing to think about, but that's actually what happened in a lot of cases. We have, as you know, people that have come from families that remember there's a strong oral tradition, there's a continuation. But what we found recently is that there's been a lot of that interplay you know, mutual influence and all this kind of stuff. So I don't think it's a straight line, but I think that uh, when it comes down to it, um, our, the, the Europeans who came here were impressed with something. 
that we had. You know, they they were impressed with the fact of the level of and the and the intensity of the commitment to freedom that our people had and the way that our society was organized to accomplish both respect for individual freedom and autonomy and a social organization that benefited everybody and that importantly that did not oppress anybody. Women were not oppressed, youth were not oppressed. They had found a way to do that. And I think that there's no way to go back in time and recreate the particular social and political arrangements that our ancestors had. But those values and, and certain of the techniques and certain of the mechanisms that are political tools for achieving consensus and guaranteeing freedom and not oppressing people in creating social organization, that, that undoubtedly comes from our ancestral heritage. And, and we need to really focus in on that and, uh, and try to understand how it operates in the, in the contemporary context. That's actually the work I'm doing now in Ganawangi, is trying to figure out this transition from the, uh, the imposed uh, elected system of government we have um, to restore traditional governance. And, and so it's an ongoing process in the community and we're, we're working with, with everyone in the community, listening to everybody, delving into our history, delving into our language, trying to learn as much as we can internally and from these sources that, uh, that offer us a glimpse of our ancestral way to, to once again kind of reinstill that, that way of life and that, those kind of social relations that our ancestors had and that so impressed everybody from Europe when they came here. And, and I should mention, you know, that that work is incredibly important um, because so much of modern, I don't know if you want to call it statecraft, is either influenced by Marxism, which was influenced by us in some regard, or influenced by how the United States as a, as a country or, or even Canada has operated um, and how much all three of those systems um, borrow or allegedly borrowed from us. So the, getting that correct um, could have world-changing uh, consequences um, in, in, a, in a positive light, I would say. For sure. Our ancestors have always said that. And is it, isn't it ironic that both Marxism and the United States system were in, claimed to be inspired by the Haudenosaunee? <laughs> I, I just I, well, I want to make a quick comment. I just think it's ironic that a lot of Marxists do say that um, Marx got his ideas from in, observing indigenous peoples or studying them. But at the same time, it's like, why are you so hesitant to read decolonial theory <laughs> and you know and support decolonization? You know, it's it, to me it's very it's the irony of it. I can I, can I maybe suggest one reason just from having. Uh, taught for so many years in university and encountered all kinds of graduate student know-it-alls and, uh, and, and smart asses. It's, uh, it's because a lot, of, a lot of them think that we've been corrupted or that we've been assimilated and that all they see when they see Native people are casinos and people doing business and people being integrated into capitalism just like everyone else. So I think a lot of them don't really understand Indigenous people in the way that I'm talking about it in terms of a, a resurgent traditional indigenous identity and philosophy, they just see the, they just see the surface of the contemporary, which admittedly is capitalist. So I think that we have to run work through that problem. That's that's just yeah. what I run into in my my uh, different uh, teaching moments. Yeah, you know, I ran into that this last year. I had a, a non-native uh, call me and tell me that. Uh, he's anti-indigenous sovereignty because he read *Prisoner of Grass* by Howard Adams, and he was like, "Oh, you know, Howard Adams talks about how native governments are corrupt." But you know, I was, I told him, you know, you read this wrong, <laughs> you know, you read this wrong, completely wrong. And it's actually scary that a settler would read Howard Adams' book, and it come out with an anti-sovereignty, you know, point of view for us. And I, you know, that's what scares me about you know settlers reading. Our work uh, and, and you know taking the wrong messages. This is why I tell people, you know, you know, you know, Mr. Alfred, you're not a Marxist, but you should, you know, they should 
understand the historical you know background of what you're writing and why you are talking about these things and the tr tr uh, traditional forms of government and how even you know I I criticize the Comanche government too. I mean I think we have a lot of work to do you know and um, but that's for us to deal with. It's not for settlers to interject how our government should be you know and what their ideas of our, how our government should be and that's why actually it's it's to me scary how they want to interject or they dismiss us because you know they i don't know it's weird it's almost like they think native governments are perfect you know and it's like no we're not we have issues because of southern colonization because of capitalism if you don't mind i'd like to cut in there because that was actually exactly the point that i was um going to bring up but that this 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 confusion in the settler is rooted in the fetishization of of our societies, um, and this idea that we were quote unquote the most the most free, right? And um, to sort of aside to something that John Trudell would say is that that people are habitual users of of specifically that word, the word freedom. They don't necessarily understand what it means and how it relates to societal responsibility and not individualism. Um, and I think, as I said, that's part of where the confusion come from, comes from. And then they see things like perhaps minor government corruption or casinos or uh, natives participating in the capitalist business model. And instead of seeing people that survived um, under a system that was imposed on them, they see um, corruption or dishonesty or um, words that they don't apply to their own society and their own analysis of their own society. Or if they do, only from a Marxist lens. It's, you know, even non Marxists think of these things as corruption or dishonesty. Whereas in their own society, they see America as free, the, you know, the leader of the free world and, you know, the world's police. Could I just throw something in here real quick? Because, because Victor, uh, the discussion that you were bringing up there, this kind of like fetishization or this idealized version of what like a native person should be. I was just reading this book last month. It's called Life and Oil. It's about the Kofan people of Ecuador and Colombia and how the Kofan people have like in a more modernized way have been like, we want to own our oil for the benefit of our community. We have oil here and we don't want it to be siphoned. We want to take it and we want to use it to build our community in a certain way. And they talk about how like people come there and visit white people come there, people from, uh, you know, North America, you know, the, the Ladino people, uh, come there and they, they criticize them as if like, it's like, oh no, you should like remain in these like, kind of like less modernized houses and you're giving up so much of your culture. And it's like this, like, uh, this like uh double-edged sword where it's like like these other cultures are like imposing them like this is how indigenous people are supposed to live you're supposed to like just live off the land and be primitive and like uh it's the first time that was really brought to my attention as like a white person who really only understands indigenous culture from this like outside perspective or what i was taught in public American schools and things like that. And it's interesting for you to bring that up in this context when I was just reading about this as it goes on in Ecuador also. And I mean, I just one last pin that I wanted to put in here is like, we're kind of asking like, why is there this kind of like refutation of decolonial theory within Western Marxists? And I think it's really comes down to, I think it's, there's a lot of Western Marxists that they see something going on in Bolivia. They see something going on in Africa. They see something going on in Asia and they love to just wave the banner of decolonialism and like, yep, tear that down. And this, but when it comes with potentially upending this 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 social stratum that they exist in and benefit from, I think they're much more uh, hesitant to full throatedly endorse the dismantling of that system. That's just my opinion as someone that kind of comes from that side of the world. Well, Pat, it's so much easier for them to fetishize either the Soviet Union yeah. that no longer <laughs> exists or this like weird idea or concept they have in their mind of china as this paradise this you know workers state you know where nothing wrong can ever happen because if something goes wrong if it's not perfect right then it's not worth supporting right if it's not if it doesn't meet their their idealized internalized fantasy right then like well then it's wrong 
right and that like you know i i can't support that then and i think that purity we see test. yeah i said th- th- yeah purity test. testing purity yeah, testing we're right, exactly we're running in an hour so i don't want to keep mr out for too long i know he's in the time frame so we should probably wind down victor victor has his hand up so do you want to give him the last word and then we'll close it up well you should probably give you should probably give Alfred the, the last word, but um, I was going to say that like you guys are really referencing the, the sort of performative nature of quote unquote anti-imperialism among the Western left. Okay, well, hopefully we have Mr. Alfred on again. I, we do want to talk about his other books specifically, Peace, Power, Righteousness, and Wasasi specifically. I do think because because I I don't feel like these topics are on YouTube, <laughs> you know, I really do think we should do a book review or book analysis with Mr. Alfred, because I do feel that settlers should be able to reference, you know, you listen to these videos and say, hey, I should read Wasase, you know, I should read A uh, Peace Power of Righteousness. They should regardless with whether there's a video or not. But with the video, I think it's easier for sellers to listen to and be like, hey, now let me check this out, right, myself. And this is why I want to have these other uh, other episodes with you, Mr. Alfred, because I do want to help people understand with your input in your own books about your, your past works. So, uh, yes, thank you. Well, okay, I'm going to look forward to that. I uh, enjoyed the conversation, and uh, there's probably about five different directions that we could have gone in, you know? And so, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's set up another time and uh, let's spend another hour talking. And uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rick, for the invitation. It's good to meet you two guys. And Victor, uh, you said you weren't uh, an intellectual, but I mean, <laughs> uh, so I, I would I would claim that title if I was you. And I uh, look forward to talking to you again and maybe meeting you in person sometime. Thank you for your time, Mr. Alfred. That, we, uh, that would be that would be fantastic. I just want you to know that we're we are so blessed to have you. As as a member of the you know the greater Orina Shota community, that means a lot. Thank you, Yamagawa. My apologies for for not letting you respond to that directly, Victor. I just want to say thank you so much for your time. We appreciate having you on uh, for the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Alfred, and also thank you so much to Rick and Victor also for coming on, just so that you know we could have kind of like a more uh, a, a, a more diversified view of like indigenous uh, in, in the indigenous the field of indigenous studies. I don't know if that what would, what is the right term for that? that like, I don't even know if that's like a weird <laughs> way to put that, but a more diverse representation of indigenous philosophical perspectives. There you Hell go. Yeah. That's why Nailed I brought it. that's why I have the experts <laughs> on here. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Just you. because of that, that's why they gave me a PhD. So. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> thank you again, Mr. Alfred, so much. We look forward to having you on again. And uh, you know, uh Law Salam, stay strong out there. Um, and uh, we'll see you again soon. See you soon. Bye, everybody. You like? I'm gonna stop the recording now.